We left uh, uh, January 16th, uh, uh, Hunter's Point, with the first Atomic Bomb aboard. And then we went to Fontinian, where it took us nine days, which is a record. And, uh, and uh, like I, we was talking about earlier on it, in other words, I stood in the fan, fan fail sometimes talking to some of the guys, and some of the old timers kept saying, what the hell's our big hurry? In other words, we were flying. You know, they tell me, go uh, 20, about 29 to 30 knots, that's what we did. Some of the old timers said, the damn ship will blow up. In other words, the engines are not built to take that kind of speed that long. But we did. We made it anyhow. And so, and then we're on the Guam, and then we're going from Guam to Leyte. We knew it was something high secret, but the way it was protected with that two Marines on 24, the, up in officers' quarters, and also the bomb itself, see. But you know what the old timer said, and why it was so highly secret, because it was sent in toilet paper for MacArthur, as everybody says. <laughs> so that was a true story. That was, that's exactly what they said. So, but everybody had their opinion. There was no, actually no name on the bomb until after it was dropped, my opinion. When it was on the ship, you have eight hours off, and then you have four hours on watch. Out uh, of that eight hours, you had to take a shower, you had to eat, write a letter, get some sleep. That sounds like eight hours a long time, but, but to do all them things, at eight, you get four or five hours of sleep, maybe. See? But you're eight on on, four hours on watch. My watch is up in, uh, they call uh, on the ship, up in uh, my officer's quarters, uh, place of watch. And the second place is on the, on the bow on the ship, way in the bow. In fact, that's where I was when the ship blew up. Yes, I was getting my, in other words, I was supposed to have a four to eight watch in the morning up on the bow. And I laid down at 10, about quarter to 12, and the ship blew up at 10 after 12. I was asleep already. What did you guys do when you guys first got to your first destination? We got the, we got Tinian. And I stood up on that bow area there, and I watched them, a big crane come in, unload that. A Tommy bomber in the box, and then uh, we didn't stick around very long. We went to Guam. I hear it's about ninety miles away, and that's that's when we got supplies. They went on to going on to Tinian. All right, uh, Leyte. Leyte, okay. So, did after the at that time, whatever was secretive was dropped off. Did you guys get a different set of orders? Um, no, we were told we were going to Leyte to join the Seventh Fleet for the invasion of Japan. That was the purpose we was going there. The captain asked for a Navy escort. MacArthur, which I hate his guts, I can tell you stories about them, that he said no because there was, they didn't want to release any ships for the invasion of Japan. MacArthur, but he, he should have give us escort, but it never did. So in other words, I can blame MacArthur, not for the sinking of the ship maybe, but the loss of men. That's, that's where the, halfway between Guam and Leyte, that's where it happened. Okay. We, le we left Leyte, or I mean Guam, uh, Friday morning, and we do in the uh, Leyte, Tuesday morning. And we sunk Sunday night, so it was halfway in between. That's what it boils down to be. I was sleeping topside by the Indian's gun. We'd take a Navy blanket and fold it in two, and I did it the night before, and make a little sleeping bag, and we sew it. And we'd take our clothes off, all but our shorts, and our shoes, and make a pillow, and sleep topside. It was two down below deck. I laid down about quarter to 10 minutes to 12. And my man was supposed to wake me up a quarter to four. He went up on the toward the bow. Joe Jackman, which is a good friend of mine, he come off the ship alive also. And uh, in other words, that's where I was sleeping. When the bow, when the torpedoes hit, I went up in the air, and I can't tell you if it went two feet or twenty feet. I all I could feel myself going through the air. 
I picked myself with a cable going on the outside of the ship. I grabbed hold of that cable. So I went up someplace and I went over about eight feet. That I know for sure. Maybe ten. Anyhow, I banged my leg up a little bit. So anyhow, uh, then I went uh, uh, forward. No, I went aft to see Jack and mine. Well, the bow was gone. I said, when that torpedo hit, Jack and mine probably walking around by the alien's guns up there, and he's gone. And then uh, I went aft, and we made about 10, 12 other guys, maybe 12, I don't know how many, was engulfed with flames. We couldn't go to cross quite. So we went forward again, and that's when the ship, a couple of them said they were going to go down. So they cut down the life rafts, I can show you under the picture, on a, by the eight inch guns on the side of them. We cut down three or four of them, and behind the eight inch guns were a big canvas bag of life jackets. And they cut them down, and I got one of them. By that time, the ship was really slipping to the starboard side. It was slipping so fast that you couldn't hardly stand on the deck. So I slid down the deck 15, 20 feet, then the ship left. Everybody asked you, where was you on the ship when you jumped off the ship? I didn't jump off that ship. The ship left me. When I was gone, I swam away. So I didn't jump that far. <laughs> so it was, of course, it's real dark, and uh, we rode 8 to 10 foot, maybe 12 foot swells until Monday night or Tuesday morning. We had up and down. So I don't know how many got off the ship. How scared were you when this was all happening, or were you scared? Uh, what were your emotions or your nerves like? I wasn't scared. Everything happened so damn fast, it didn't get scared. You just got accepted. But after you did the water floating around, and then you woke up Sunday, I mean, you got daylight Sunday morning, and tried to figure everything out, and it wasn't, wasn't good. The guys that were wounded or any kind of blood, they didn't live long. I was saturated with diesel fuel, and that, that, led, that led to saving my life, because the sharks didn't like the smell of diesel fuel. There's a story by itself about that. And, uh, but I, and Tuesday the ship kind of calmed down, or the waves, and that's when the sharks moved in. So I've seen men taking from, sharks from here to that wall, and uh, twice a shark come up my, I was kind of a sleep mode, and uh, twice I felt something poking me in a life jacket. I looked in the shark eyeballs, my eyeballs, about that far apart. Did that twice, two different times. I don't know if it's the same shark or not. <laughs> Anyhow, I was told I was saturated with diesel fuel, and that diesel fuel saved my life because they don't like the smell of diesel fuel. Makes sense. So, but. Uh, but a lot of her, you know, taking. Okay, a lot of people ask me how big a group you was in, but it's hard to say because you only see it take when you're top of that swell. See the swell by the size of this room, you know, and you will know, just see. You really couldn't tell how many was in there. I know Monday, you know, noon or so, a Catholic priest was on the ship. He sw he was in our area. He swam over that way and asked me or asked us guys. Anybody Catholic, yeah, so I'd swim over this way and I'd give you the last sacrament, which I did. So, and then he swam away, and I talked to a survivor at the reunion. He died Wednesday, we're going from one group to another. He wore himself out. That's how he died. So, uh, Paul McGinnis, I've seen him, from West Virginia. And, uh, one of those things. But I see men get so thirsty, they say they're going to take, they take their life jackets off. They say their surface dive, going down below deck, get a cold drink of water. You do that, you drink gulp water, salt water on every stomach, you got about one or two hours to live. Your eyeballs pop out, foam comes to your mouth, and you go totally insane. You splash around. I had guys splash the hell out of me because they, they did that. They encouraged, they go crazy. So I didn't want to do that. I didn't think that was a very good idea. So I didn't do that. 
So it's a kind of temptation to stay away from that water. I'm be drinking it. My brother, Robert Terry, last name of T.E. Allen. We started out for a bank and we started right next to each other. And great guy from Hartford City, Indiana. I don't never did happen what to his dad, but he had a mother. And we decided in the, fam- in the water, if I didn't make it, he'd go see my parents. If he didn't make it, I'd go see his mother. Well, he didn't make it. They dropped rafts out in the water. Me and, and Terry and two other men, I don't know who they were, decided to swim probably 40, 50 yards. It's hard to determine because you're putting your sunlight to that raft. The two other guys, I don't know who they were, their hearts stopped along the way from exhaustion. Terry by, by the shark, I got to the raft. There was a guy that was on the raft, out of their heads, three, four of them, five, I forget. And they couldn't help me on the raft. I couldn't get on the raft, so I stayed. I just tied myself to that raft. So I stayed next to it. I stayed tomorrow until Friday morning before I picked up. In other words, I've been kicking myself in the ass for all these 73 years. Why did we make up our mind? We stayed where we were at. Maybe them three guys would have lived. But it wasn't my decision, it was our decision. You know what I'm saying? Just like, you know, where are we going to go? You know? Somebody said, there's a raft right there, let's go. So we did. You know what I'm saying? And they didn't make it. That's part of life. So there's, there's no rhyme or reason. So there was a total of four of you that tried to make it to the raft. Yeah. Two did not make it because their heart stopped. Huh? The other guy got ate by a shark. Yeah. And you, you were the man that made it. That's right. What When it gets dark and you're in the ocean at night, what goes through your mind? Well, every time I did, what you do, you're so damn tired, you fall into a kind of a half, half sleep, half unconscious mode. It's hard to explain. So... Actually, the nights went fast because it was, I actually was sleeping. Was, you no, know, the wave was uh, the ocean calmed down enough where you didn't have to kind of paddle around too much. So, if the ocean wouldn't have calmed down the last two days, I don't think any of us would have made it. But that helped. Put that way, my opinion: you get so hungry and so thirsty, and after that. You start losing weight and and start losing your mind. So that's it. I mean, it's hard, Doc. It, it's so hard to explain exact feelings. You know what I'm saying to you? But that's the. You know, I'm told you get so thirsty, you so much, then you start losing weight. But how much weight I lost, I don't know. <laughs> but. Well, our doctors told David, told I, you cannot live that long. That was all food and water. So, what does, I guess, being in salt water for so long, what does it do to the human body? Like, what side effects were you guys starting to get? Well, after, after I have, they call salt water ulcers. You have them on your leg. Right here, you can feel them two little knobs, right? Right here. Now and then the barber would clip the, that bigger one. Anyhow, I had a salt water ulcer right there because that's where you that's where your life jacket rubbed. The top part of your life jacket rubbed. And uh and uh and you're a while get your system back to it. And also uh, diesel fuel. I mean what Every night, they, that, or every day, they had to change our sheet, throw them away, because we could, wherever we laid, blacker than hell. The sweat, we would, we would pump a diesel fuel out of our bodies for, for three, four days. It's easier to die out there than it is to try to stay alive. You had to work at it. You know what I'm saying? You had to try to roll a little bit, wave hits in the mouth, or somebody wheels at it, or... For example, you could hear somebody go outside of your group, probably from here to that wall, and you could hear them scream, the shark. Then a few minutes later, here comes a big red spot of blood floating by you. 
you know, we'll ask for that guy. Different things like that. Kind of gets to you, but you know what I'm saying to you? <laughs> and third, Wednesday night, uh, just before dark, I was a group of about eight or ten guys. And uh, I don't know who he was. They ain't looking for us Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They're not looking for us. Hell, this is it. This is where we're going to die. And Thursday morning, here come Chuck Webb with his airplane. <laughs> and that's when he spotted us, so about 10, 11 o'clock, something like that. Now, that great big ocean, miles and miles and miles and miles of water out there. He happened to look down to that particular time and seen the oil slick. So Chuck says, well, what? So they found the wood and they wound it in. They went back to his co pilot. Do you see that oil slick? No. Chuck said, I'll go back and see there's more out there. You know? So he dropped so many feet and come back over it again. Well, the oil slick was there. But he couldn't, wasn't satisfied with what he was looking at. He wanted to see more information, more different things floating out. So uh, Chuck said he dropped some more. And that's when he seen man in the water. And then after he seen it, he come over the top of me with his Bombay doors open and he had a plane swinging back and forth. And I, yeah, my heart was right in my throat. <laughs> oh, yeah, I told Chuck that. He come right on top of me. And, uh, and it wasn't kind of him really checking on that oil slick, really looking it over. It would never but none of us survive. And that's when he uh, got a hold of Adrian Marks. He was also up patrolling too, and they landed the seaplane. One thing you don't realize, and nobody else did, when Adrian Marks landed the seaplane in the water to pick up these big men, he didn't know who they were or where we came from. Do you know that? A lot of people don't realize it. Sure, he landed and picked up guys, 58 men, 56, 56. But he didn't know who they were or where the hell they came from when he went down. He said he dropped survivor gear. And his men told Adrian Marks there was men taken by sharks right down. The men could see it. Adrian Marks said, that's enough for me. A nine-man crew told all his nine men, get this back of that plane as far as you can to keep the tail section up. They put all that I met. Adrian Mark was the only one in the pilot seat, and he put that plane down by accident, by luck. They started taxiing around, picking up. And then when he started picking the guys up, that's when they found the ship was down. From Sunday night to Thursday afternoon, nothing. Um, what, what sort of things like help you keep alive? My dad. No problem. My dad did it. I got home, I told my dad that. Dad said, how the hell did I do that? And I told him how. And I said, you did it. I had, to, I had something to live for. And I told I promised dad I'd come home and damn it, I'm going to come home. And I worked at it. <laughs> Sound a little far-fetched maybe, but. Not at all. <laughs>